I mean, you had responsibility for that border security. Give us a sense of the responsibility we're putting on the, on the shoulders of people like at TSA, and for that matter, on our border with Mexico or border with Canada. <clears throat> well, I mean, I think that obviously there's going to be a new set of requirements. I think they at least discussed the possibility of requiring testing uh, within a, a day before you come into the United States. There'll, I think, be some checking at the border in terms of whether uh, people have a randomized testing or temperature or things of that sort. So there'll be an operational change that will have to go into effect. Now, there, this has happened before, and we've dealt with it. But, you know, it always a little bit of a shakedown that's required to get everybody up to speed on the new protocols to make sure they're properly equipped. And, of course, at the land borders, you get a lot of pressure because there you've got a huge volume of people, and that means you've got a lot of additional folks you have to test or evaluate. Well, well, I talk about the land border just for a moment, Michael, because we do hear, I've heard on this program several times, and I must say often it's from Republican lawmakers saying part of the problem with the pandemic actually is that border with Mexico. There's a fair amount of disease coming across the border. Do we know if that's true? I, I don't really know that that's true. I mean, it reminds me of people saying that, oh, the border with Mexico is a vehicle for or an avenue for a lot of terrorists to come in, which turned out not to be true. In fact, if we've gotten terrorists coming across the land border, it has typically been from Canada, not Mexico. So I think that gets swept up in politics. Um, I don't think there's a particularly high level of disease coming through Mexico. But again, you know, you have to look at all the borders, land, sea, and air, if you're going to take a comprehensive approach. Uh, so, Michael, we're going to the holiday season. Obviously, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we're going to be focused once again on COVID, in particular this Omicron variant. But give us a sense of what other security risks that w might be uh, heightened during this uh, holiday season. Well, I think one of the risks which will continue is this risk in terms of cybersecurity. As more of us have worked remotely, we've been using our devices uh, on the network. Many of those devices are not particularly well protected, and these become avenues for people to engage in cyber attacks. But beyond that, we've seen a dramatic increase in ransomware. We've seen attacks on healthcare systems, colonial pipeline, um, other kinds of you know, critical infrastructure. And I have every reason to believe that may continue, and that's going to require uh, a strategic uh, change in terms of how we look at cybersecurity, both from the government and from the private sector. I know the government now is focusing on upping the game in terms of defending critical infrastructure, and I expect within very short order we're going to see some additional new steps taken to make sure we are protecting ourselves against uh, not only criminal groups, but frankly, geopolitical adversaries like Russia and Iran. And we had that spate of incidents, including pipelines and things like that, a lot of ransomware attacks. Uh, they seem to have died down a, a, a good deal. Is that because we're doing a better job? I don't think it's died down, frankly. I think maybe they've paused a little bit. Um, we are doing somewhat of a better job. I know the TSA, for example, put out rules with respect to pipelines that increase their cybersecurity um, capabilities. But I wouldn't count on this going away. And in fact, there was a story reported recently in the news about the Iranians attacking their major health care system in Israel. So this is going to be with us for some time. And particularly as matters heat up with Russia and Ukraine, we may wind up feeling some effects of that in terms of uh, cyber disruption aimed at distracting the United States from being too engaged in what's going on in Europe. Mr. Secretary, take us back into your old job for a moment, because there are various incidents. We had that terrible incident with the Waukesha holiday parade with the motorists who drove through the parade. We also have all of these apparently organized uh, smash and grab, I don't know what you call it, thieves sort of breaking into stores in Northern California. At what point does that become a homeland security issue rather than simply a local law enforcement issue? Well, I think certainly if you're dealing with an organized group, uh, particularly one that's motivated by terrorism, it does become a homeland security issue. I don't know that the Wisconsin case was a terrorist issue. I think it may have been somebody involved in criminal activity fleeing and trying to distract. And these efforts to uh, engage in smash and grab looting in California again seem mainly criminal. What I do think we see, though, is a phenomenon in which as someone carries out 
for example, a, a series of criminal acts, others watch it and they start to imitate it. And this is really a challenge for social media, whether these platforms are now becoming vehicles for inciting bad behavior on the part of those who watch it succeed and go, well, I'm going to do this too. And that means we're going to need to take a closer look at how do we work with social media to make sure they're not becoming incendiary tools in promoting criminality and violence. Well, and you raise such an interesting point. I mean, obviously, you were a lawyer, U.S. attorney, a court of appeals judge in the Third Circuit. And as you know well, in criminal law, conspiracies are worse than individuals acting. So some of this is the organization involving other people, whether it's internationally in a terrorist group or homegrown. Can you compare the risk of international terrorism with respect, as opposed to just homegrown terrorism that's organized? Well, right now, we've actually done a, a good job over the last 20 years in protecting our country against international terrorists coming in from overseas or from another part of the world. And that's, again, a tribute to a lot of the very fine work done by the folks at the border. When you're dealing with homegrown terrorism, there's no border. It's right next door. And I think that's why we're seeing an increase in the homegrown terrorist acts, whether it's attacks on religious institutions or things in schools, um, inspired in many cases by the Internet, but sometimes just self-generated. And that's much harder to deal with because it's low profile. There's usually not a, a lot of planning and communication. And the intelligence agencies are much more limited in their ability to examine intelligence domestically than is the case overseas because we do have certain constitutional protections. And that's why the issue of homegrown terrorism and violence is going to require much more engagement by local law enforcement and even by local communities who have to be willing to speak up when they see a threat rising in the neighborhood.